of dialogue is two words, so there's that. Um, so memory, um, this piece is very descriptive and a lot of things are like very memorable, like the drugs being very violent, um, describing the woman, which was very interesting. Now we're going to move on to our rhetorical analysis of a dialogue of a conflict. Do you remember he went on, writing in your diary, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two makes four? Yes, said Winston. O'Brien left, held up his left hand, it back toward Winston with the thumb hidden in the four fingers extended. How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? Four. And if the party says that it is four, but five, then how many? Four. The word ended in a gasp of pain. The needle of the dial was shot up to 55. The sweat had sprung out all over Winston's body. The air tore in his lungs and issued again deep groans, which even by clenching his teeth he could not stop. O'Brien watched him, the four fingers extend. He drew back the lever. This time the pain was only slightly eased. How many fingers, Winston? Four. The needle went up to sixty. How many fingers, Winston? Four, four. What else can I say? Four. The needle must have risen again, but he did not look at it. The heavy stern face and the four fingers filled his vision. The fingers filled up before his eyes like pillars, enormous, blurry, and seemed to vibrate, but, mistake but unmistakably four. How many fingers, Winston? Four. Stop it, stop it. How can you go on? Four, four. How many fingers, Winston? Five, five, five. No, Winston, that is no use. You're, own you're lying. You still think that there are four. How many fingers bleed? Please. Four, five, four. Anything you like, only stop the pain. So we'll, uh, I guess the logos of this, of, um, well, I guess <clears throat> O'Brien is trying to make Winston not only say that there are five fingers when he's only holding up four, but make him believe it. So he's, I guess he's trying to condition him into doing that by applying electric shocks and making Winston feel pain whenever he said four to give a negative connotation to saying four, so that he will start saying five, so maybe if he says five enough, then he will start to believe it himself. He also plays like on the ethos of O'Brien and how like he knows when he's lying, he knows like how to get him to do this without like, with, I mean obviously with pain, but he knows how to make him think this and get him that way of thinking versus like just uh, Winston sticking to his beliefs is what he thought he was going to do when he went into this place. Mm -hmm. Um, this also has pathos because the reader, like, feels sorry for Winston because he's, like, going through all this pain just because, like, he refuses to, like, lie, which is interesting. And then O'Brien, like, doesn't really seem to, like, feel sorry for Winston. Like, he doesn't really care that he's in pain. He just wants him to believe something that isn't true. He wants to help him. Yeah. Do you think he really wants to help him or he just wants the party to stay in power? Yeah. Air quotes help him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say party because remember... Like, that's why they were, like, in charge of the polls, and, like, they just, uh, like, the object of the party is that power. And I think they want to make sure that they don't have, like, any insurgents who, like, will take away their power or, like, attempt to. So the style... <laughs> <laughs> so the style? <laughs> the style is, um, this is a dialogue between Winston and O'Brien. Um, there's a lot of repetition of rhetorical questions, um... O'Brien keeps asking, how many fingers am I holding up? But he knows what the answer is supposed to be, and so does Winston. But Winston still answers incorrectly. Well, in O'Brien's view, incorrectly, but in Winston's view, he's answering the question what he, with what he thinks is the answer. So that just kind of reinforces what O'Brien is trying to do here. He's trying to make Winston believe that two plus two equals five and not four. And by doing that, he repeats questions that he knows Winston knows what the answer should be. Can we also talk about like the stylistic choice of choosing two plus two equals four because, or two plus two equals five, because that's something like you grow up with, with like, oh, that's such an obvious statement. Like people make jokes like, ha, two plus two equals I wouldn't five. Know it's like from or, this book, or I, like yeah. if it had been in existence before yeah. that. I thought it was a very like interesting like, choice. Big Brother that, is from this and yeah. like other, like Newspeak or like double think, like things that like are Thought kind place. of common. Yeah. yeah. Like, in I our remember society. growing up watching, like, the cartoons that are, like, 2 plus 2 equals fish, or, like, 2 plus 2 equals whatever, yeah. and, like, it was just, like, the fact that I remember, like, there was an episode of, like, Timmy Turner and Fairly Odd Parents where they literally, like, magically changed the answer to, like, 5, and then they had to I change it back, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so the fact that, like, this is kind of, like you said, probably, maybe influenced, probably, mm -hmm. 
influence all these different generations but I think the way they like arranged it was very like um very clever on his part how like they kept asking all those questions and the repetition of it and the power of four and five and like how even when he does finally say five that like O'Brien is like I know you're lying just tell me just like do what I want you to say and then this will all be over so like I think that's also um the invention of it also um does the means of persuasion by finally getting Winston to crack um so the memory it's a lot of repetition so it's easy for the breather to hear and like Maddie said like we all grow up with like oh two plus two equals four not five ha 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 so I think we all have like some familiarity with this already because of that and delivery um it's like oral mostly they're talking for most of it and then um sometimes there'll be like a few sentences about how much pain Winston is in so it's just like a big contrast between like saying like numbers that you wouldn't think it would have a big deal but then him saying the wrong number gives him pain <laughs> poor Winston so we're go- following we're going into our closing statements right now about the book does anyone have anything they want to say before um, we finish our last <clears throat> podcast? I just I can see why this book has been so long lasting and how a lot of phrases from this book have been um, adopted into society, even though a lot of people di- don't know what comes from this. Like I didn't know the term "big brother" for government came from mm-hmm. this, but it did, and I just kind of think that speaks to the to the fact that it was very influ- influential. Yeah, like I think that's like a sign of like when something has like a big influence is that like when something from the it has literary merit because when something from the book like is in our society and so prevalent that like everybody knows it then like and they like I didn't even read the book and I knew Big Brother like you said like I think that shows like how much of an impact it had on the society where like and it's still relevant like the themes everything are still relevant today because like governments like we hear about like dictatorships and like government having like too much control like over its citizens and having too much power so the things are still relevant today even if we are long past the year of 1984. I also think this book is also a huge like um like a lesson basically saying like how this happened was a very logical solution and that this could happen and basically kind of giving you advice of how like not to let this happen and how not to let this big brother involve and like how to make sure everyone keeps their freedoms that they are rightfully supposed to have. Anything else, guys? Bye. Thank you for listening. (laughs) Thanks for listening, guys. That'll be our last ever podcast for the 1984 novel by George Orwell.